Hi, I'm Kay Norman. Um, I'd just like to say, first of all, that I'm so inspired by all the speakers that I've heard. Um, Sharon, Mark, Pam, and um, the girls from up north too. I just think you're amazing, and the cat people as well. Um, I run a small rescue charity in Melbourne, Victoria, and we rescue mainly small breed dogs. Um, we usually take those needing surgery, the elderly, the palliative, um, the difficult medical cases from a wide range of places such as rural pounds in Victoria, as well as interstate, um, and the general shelters around in and around Melbourne, and of course, from the general public who have decided to surrender their own pets. Rescued with Love was born of the belief that we are part of the bigger picture and that everyone should be working to their own strengths and uh, what they know and what they can cope with. Um, all our rescue groups were all different and each and every one should be recognised as unique. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to rescue or whatever you rescue. It doesn't matter whether it's cats or dogs, both small or large. Um, we face all different kinds of um, issues such, and we come from different angles, uh, different demographics. We have a wide variety of expectations and experiences. We experience difficulties, problems, issues that others might not experience. Um, I'm sure the girls up north wouldn't experience what we do down in Melbourne and vice versa. We certainly don't have your blowflies or anything like that. Um, and uh, together, when you put all of us in one full circle, that's helping companion animals to the best of the community's ability. Rescued with Love has been running for just on eight years now, and we have about 30 volunteers, ranging from 23 years of age to the late 60s. We live all over Melbourne. Some are retired, some are working, single, married, divorced. We're just a melting pot, really, all with a common goal. And due to being so diverse, one of the things I've encouraged is the get-togethers for Rescued with Love carers. And this has really been a part of our success and of great benefit to RWL by forging support and friendships amongst the rescue foster carers and like-minded people. It encourages them as a group, which is important, so they don't feel that they have only just me to support them, um, but they have a number of friends doing exactly what they do to talk things over about their current dog, its treatment, a new adoption and their expectation. It engages them to be an active working part of Rescued with Love without my input and thus giving them a greater sense of achievement. And we move together more like an engine instead of just a, a few spare parts hanging around together. One of the things I'm passionate about is giving our foster carers the responsibility to actually do the house checks of their own foster dogs. Unlike shelters, we have the ability to go into the community and, and make informed decisions on where our dogs can be adopted to. This is important as many of our rescue dogs are special needs and for us it is a common goal to be part of the solution and not the continuing problem of rehoming inappropriately. And no matter who it is that wants to adopt one of our dogs, we are always going to do a house check. <laughs> As I have a responsibility for the pastoral care of my volunteers, I think of them doing house checks and meeting their potential adopters. It gives the carers a sense of achievement and some control. And many of them form friendships uh, with the families and they get updates on the dogs in return extending the support for Rescued with Love. So it's a win-win. The dog is adopted, carers get follow-up stories, new adopters become supporters, they tell their friends and family and so forth. It's all important when working in the community as we do. I have a few basic rules that I don't veer from when I'm dealing with our carers. I try to, re uh, sorry, I try to protect and respect their home environment and that of their family members and their pets. Here are a few ways I attempt to do this. People are not going to foster for you and help you save lives if you encroach on their family life and disrespect their family, their private life. Respect and privacy are a must. Usually I'll contact a carer when they receive a new dog within 24 hours to make sure that they're okay and they're handling the dog and no major issues are coming up. Any problems the carers have is dealt with immediately. 
It can be a medical issue, behavioural, um, whatever it takes, it must be dealt with. They might need a larger collar, special shampoo, extra treatment, whatever it is, it's just dealt with. If a dog needs to be moved or is requested by the carer to be moved, it is done immediately, there's no excuse. Most of my carers are experienced, so this really happens now, but it can as people's lives can take a turn for the worst or they can have a personal tragedy. Some problems must be dealt with, so problems must be dealt with and not put off um, to make them deal with the solution that is far from perfect. Any aggression is immediately dealt with, and I mean with the dogs here, not the foster carers. Um, the source of the aggression is discussed, the reason for the display of aggression, any escalation, and our options. Rescued with Love has euthanised dogs for unprovoked dominance aggression, and although this issue can be more serious in a Rottweiler than a two kilo Maltese, the situation is, al the situation is always dealt with by two behaviourists, our vet, the foster carer, and myself should all agree that the dog is unpredictable with aggressive tendencies, euthanasia will be considered if no other reasonable avenues will present themselves. We do not believe in rehoming unpredictable aggressive dogs into our community, even if the public think that we're being mean just because the dog looks cute. We had a lovely looking Maltese boy leap over an 18 month old baby and latch itself onto the throat of the mother while she was folding up washing, standing nearby. Lucky she had a polo neck jumper on and he caught that. He did not let go as she stood up and attempted to go to her throat as her husband had to remove the dog with the blanket and put him in the laundry. The foster carer was extremely experienced and when she rang me and told me and was as shook up as she was, I knew I was not going to be able to safely rehome that dog in the community. For dogs, for rescued with love dogs that are dying or have lack of quality, we discuss euthanasia each and every time. The decision is always made by our vet, the foster carer, their family and myself. Our animals are always euthanized by our vet and the foster carer has the option to take the dog home for burial or rescued with love will pay for its cremation and the, the ashes are offered to the carer's family or they come home to my garden and they have a special spot for rescued with love in, um, in one of my rose bushes. The reason why all RWL dogs are given this option again is to raise the bar. We believe our dogs deserve this as a way of our respecting their lives and in circumstances, the death of the animal. It is what makes the foster carers feel more comfortable that our standards are being met and we strive for dignity and respect should a death arise. They are no longer a number in a pound but are honoured for their time on this earth even if it is only for a short while with Rescued With Love. We advocate our beliefs in the work that we do. This is little Harriet who came to us recently. That's her photo in the pound up the end there on the right. And uh, that's a tumour that was on her stomach untreated. It was um, about 30 millimetres. It was enormous. It was like the size of a tennis ball. We had it taken off, which was great. Um, it was a low to medium grade um, cancer and she's now currently living a gorgeous life and we got clean margins, so we think cancer free, let's move on. Um, RWL takes dogs that uh, would normally be considered unrehomable for their medical issues by a council ranger or pound staff. This has been a long struggle for us over years past and we still have a long struggle ahead of us to convince councils and pounds to allow us to have the dogs we want to take that are regularly killed because of their condition. This, I believe, is due to a culture of killing we've had over the years in our pounds and shelters, and it is really what drives me and defines Rescued With Love and its carers. In the community, as a societal expectation, we do not even get close to meeting an acceptable standard. Killing is killing. It should be avoided at all costs. It is justified by the public, uh, to the public by our councils, our shelters, our pounds, our legislation, the politicians and the media. It is a mindset that saw humans with disabilities locked away in institutions for being deaf or blind or segregated from daily life. 
and left us indifferent to those who did not fit the norm, such as the wheelchair-bound, the ment mentally challenged, and so forth. Now that society has moved forward in many ways in regards to the deaf or the blind, those challenged by disability who are now able to contribute meaningfully in our communities, that is what Rescued with Love desperately wants for the animals in welfare. For us, it's way past time. Our proof that it can and does work is, is in our, uh, does succeed is in our work. We've rehomed dogs with epilepsy or cancer. We've rehomed dogs with no eyeballs that are deaf, Cushing's disease and in heart failure. We palliatively care for any dog that comes to us who is terminally ill until it passes. We accept this as the norm, we do it daily. No dog is ever placed back in the pound for being too hard or too sick. No dog is ever passed on to another shelter or rescue group. The responsibility is ours, as it should be. We could not... Pro Ooh, flash. <laughs> we could not approach 50% of our work without the support of our vets and vet staff. Here's some of the specialists and some of our vets that we use and some of the dogs over the years that they've helped. Over the years, a pattern has emerged in how we work, and this is mainly due to the trust established with Anthony Gross, our head vet. He will examine a dog and give me an overall assessment on the issues we face, and together the two of us will decide how to go ahead and treat or whether we should investigate further. He's aware of our financial limitations, and we discuss the conservative wait and see options or the need for intervention should it be warranted. Their job is not an easy one particularly when we take them in the sick, manky, dying dogs and we ask them to just fix them. Um, all our dogs go straight to the, the vet clinic when they come into Rescued with Love, never straight into the foster carer's home. They're assessed and they stay for a period to make sure that we're not seeing any sickness and to receive all treatment. And once they're home in care, the love and the healing begins. It's a great help for foster carers who have pounds that vaccinate on intake, reducing the risk of quarantine, uh, sorry, reducing the issue of quarantining for us, and then they get the few days in the clinic, which is far safer result for all rescued with love, their carers and the pets. So let me show you a couple of our cases. Meet Matilda. Matilda was approximately eight years of age and she was found staggering in a paddock in circles and collected by a council ranger and taken to a council appointed vet. She was assessed and placed as she was in the pound. I, collect, I was collecting another dog when the staff told me about her and asked me to have a look. Matilda was covered in wounds and abscesses. She was missing an eye. Her remaining eye was shrunken and blind in the socket and weeping from infection. Her ears were infected. She had mammary tumours on both chains. She had a large inguinal hernia and her bowel was hanging out. Infected teeth, ingrown nails. She was emaciated and matted. I told the staff I wanted her euthanised immediately on humans on humane grounds or treated. The choice was theirs before I rang the team leader at the council. They rang their boss, I think they were a bit scared of the look on my face at the time, and treatment was offered again at the vet clinic. And I decided to make her more comfortable before she actually went off. They, this was 10 o'clock in the morning, they said she could go at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, if she was to be euthanized, I wanted to hold her so she didn't die alone. Um, I was lucky enough to have my clippers in the car that day and I stayed at the pound and shaved her off. It took about three hours with another volunteer and you couldn't cuddle her because of the wound and abscesses but she knew that we were helping her. She just kept licking our hands and saying thank you in the only way she knew how. I got home, uh, by that time I got home, uh, that night I was pretty upset. I was thinking about the compassion fatigue and crying on the way home um, and I decided to um, checked my emails, five of my carers came forward and said they wanted to take Matilda on. I decided to respect their wishes and their choice in helping her and bit the bullet and rang the council and said that we would take her on. We had to wait another five days before we could take her into care and the Rescued with Love vol volunteers visited her. For those that are overseas or aren't aware, we have an eight day policy where all stray animals must be held. Um, before they can go to rescue or they're rehomed or euthanized. Um, they cleaned her up daily, brought food from home for her, sat with her outside in the sun. 
once we had her in care, we did an initial assessment of the issues and decided to do a multi-pronged long-term treatment. The first was to remove many of the grass seeds. Overall, she had about 60 left in her body. Um, her hernia was repaired because we were worried about her bowel. She was placed on heavy antibiotic pain relief treatment for her ears for a few weeks. Um, then we removed her remaining eye, which was giving her pain, and the left side of her mammary chain and dissected her at the same time. Um, she healed beautifully after that, and then we went in again and did a, did a dental and removed the other side of her, um, her mammary tumour. She had two nice big zippers right down the front. Um, and uh, she recovered remarkably. She was amazingly stoic. Dogs in this level, they are incredibly, I can't tell you, they are, I've got five minutes. Okay, they're incredibly amazing. <laughs> um, uh, Matilda was adopted um, by a loving family um, and she used to go to school um, as an ambassador for shelter dogs and disabled people. And uh, Matilda passed away just two years, um, uh, just short of two years from her family from a number of conditions but she had full quality of life when she was with them. So our next case is Zozo, uh, Zoe. She was an 11-year-old D-sex male who was collected as a stray and surrendered by her owner. Um, Zoe had pus running out of her mouth, uh, was matted, heavy fleas, emaciated. We shaved her off and did a dental the next day. We discovered that Zoe couldn't keep any food down and was admitted into the clinic for tests. We did bloods, x-rays, biopsies, and she still couldn't keep anything down. She dropped to just on two kilos and was on the verge of dying. We expected her to die overnight, but she didn't, and her will to live was so strong. At one stage, we decided to just give her every possible drug that we could, and that 24-hour period, she stopped vomiting. We did the same again the next day and the next day, and so began her journey, and we found out she had a pre-existing condition for inflammatory bowel disease, which was left untreated by her ex-owner and was out of control. It took three weeks of fighting for her life, and eventually she came home to my husband and I. We accidentally stumbled on a food, which is advanced kitten plus food for our dog, um, that she can eat and keep down, and that's what she lives on today. She has a low-dose cortisone every few days to stop the inflammation and is our own very own little street punk. She's feisty and adorable and everybody that follows Rescued with Love knows Zozo and she's going strong and this is Zozo today. Our third case is Sweetie. Sweetie was in a country pound in New South Wales and a rescuer called us uh, to say that she had our kind of dog um, and could we possibly help. Again, she was emaciated, flea infected, um, an infected mouth. Her lower jaw was missing due to the dental decay um, that had gone right through her, um, her mandible. Um, she had an ear infection, dislocated patellas, mammary tumours and a heart murmur, so she was just our kind of dog. Um, <laughs> you think I'm kidding, don't you? <laughs> our vet bill last year for 150 dogs was $110,000, which we paid in full. Um, when she was stable enough, she flew down to us and we started treatment for her. She had all her teeth removed, placed on antibiotics, was desexed, had her mammary tumours removed, her ear infection was treated and her heart murmur was about a grade two, um, and she had, which has no symptoms, so no meds were needed there. Her back legs were a mess, but due to her age, we decided to treat those conservatively. Sweetie passed away suddenly on Monday, um, just before I came up here. Um, my husband and I are bereft, but what a joy she was. Um, she stole our hearts. I wasn't going to do this. <laughs> anyway, here she is with Zozo in her pram. Dogs like Matilda, Zozo and Sweetie. Highlight for me the, the shortcomings of our pound system in which we work. Again, it's what drives me and Rescued with Love and the girls that work with me. I'm grateful for after almost a decade, we are starting to see results. While many pounds whom we work with uh, regularly know the kind of dogs that we take that, who are spectacular in their mankiness, um, 
and in need of expensive surgery are happy to give us a call, get the dogs off their hands. Um, vets in the community are now surrendering dogs to us. Other rescue groups call us and ask if we can take dogs as we have the experience. It's great and it's satisfying. It means that our network is finally working successfully. And why we focus why the focus on our pound system must be on killing an animal out of kindness for their own good just escapes me. When did life of these beautiful darlings become so cheap? Dogs with far more minor issues than these three are still being killed and not treated. And when there are available options uh, there to save their lives, it's astonishing that these are still being ignored in Victoria. No one should ever take a life unless every option has been exhausted. And we need to network harder and take a chance. And by the way, I've just... Is Steve here, Steve Coleman? I've asked Steve to lunch, like Sharon said. <laughs> <laughs> he can run, but he can't hide. <laughs> if you want to come, Sharon... Oh. <laughs> I will make sure he pays, thank you. The gentleman always pays. Um, asking is not going to kill you, but not asking might kill the life you're entrusted to save. So again, we advocate by the very dogs we take, and I hope that we're seen as proactive in what we do. Not everyone operates like us, but I'm getting the big zero here, so I'll finish up. Um, but running this way is good for us, and therefore I hope the dogs that we rehome. Why it works for us is probably due to a few key points. Um, respect and understanding of our foster carers. Um, taking less dogs so we can afford to treat the dogs that are in our care. It's about knowing your limitations. We also take dogs from other shelters and rescue orgs if they're struggling. We'll always try and help. Um, we realise that we are in this together. Uh, we network with other private, other rescue orgs, both local and interstate. Uh, we take dogs from RSPCA Queensland. <laughs> and I'm working on Victoria and New South Wales. Um, and, uh, and if we can help someone um, with a dog, we will do our best. If we can't take the dog, we'll um, offer them another alternative. We treat each life with respect. Even when we need to euthanise an animal, it is not merely dumped into landfill but it is given a place in our homes. Um, every dog is held by a Rescued With Love volunteer when they pass away. No dog is ever euthanised alone. We update the pounds and shelters with feel-good stories of the dogs we take from them, which is a really positive aspect for everybody. Um, for example, if we take a dog from New South Wales or Queensland, we'll send them a before and after pic and let them know that the dog has been rehomed and that helps us forge great relationships. Nikki, <laughs> you get our photos. Um, and we also do ups updates of our dogs on our website and Facebook who have already been rehomed. Often people are very interested in a particular dog and when they see them, you know, rehomed and loved and cared for, it's really a pleasure for them to see the kind of work that we're doing. And nothing in animal welfare, as you probably all know, is more telling than a before and after pick. So I hope Rescued With Love um, will inspire some others to save lives. I hope that with the protocols we've got in place, we'll be around for a long time to come. I hope with our work, it will raise the bar for the animals um, so that what was once a one-off um, will become the norm. And I hope that we're going to make a difference and remain an active part in helping others in getting to zero. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.